Y'all have a seat. I... Zach, we, we're just doing too much music, man. You know, I got, I don't know about y'all, but I don't. I just can't even imagine going to church and just becoming a, a knot on a log, man. I just, I can't get over how good God is. When I see people that just get a whole dose of how good God is, it is so much fun to watch. I had a few people ask me last week at the, at the end of the service, there's a, a black dude that's my buddy, Brinson Berg. He, he came from the back, walked up here, and all I knew to do was bear hug him. And when Brinson got done bear hugging me, I was looking for oxygen, man. I mean, he was... Brinson's wife passed away four or five weeks ago. I was on a police chaplaincy call and went to their home. And um, Brinson, Brinson's got five kids and uh, a high schooler, a couple of middle schoolers, a couple of elementary schoolers. And I, I, I watched Brinson trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do, man? What do I do? And over the past few weeks, I've watched this church wrap their arms around Brinson and the other morning, he was sitting in my office, and we're literally just going through the, the Sermon on the Mount, just talking about this is how much God loves you. And I, and I watched old Brinson man tear up, and um, he said, Pastor, my, my little girl, my 10-year-old Brianna, last week she heard the story of Jesus and said, that's what I want. And little Brianna gave her life to Jesus with her daddy. And right now they're sitting, yeah, come on. And right now, they're sitting in a children's new Christians class together. And I'm going to baptize Brinson and Brianna next week as a picture of Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection and how much he loves them. And let me tell you, church, it never, ever gets old. I don't care who you are, where you're at, how old you've been, or how jaded you are toward the church. It never gets old to watch somebody get a full measure of Jesus. So when I, when I read on your cards, I want to understand the Bible more. I was supposed to start a teaching series today on 2 Timothy, a book of instruction. But I, I had 12 or 15 people this week ask me a question and said, Pastor, what is going on around Sugar Hill Church the last few weeks? Have you ever seen anything like this? And my answer is no, I don't really. I, I've never seen that many people give their life to Christ, that many people choose to follow Jesus in baptism. I've never seen people who just voluntarily got up in service and said, I want to serve the Lord. I want to burn the boats. I'm all in. I, I mean, I, I don't know that I've seen anything quite like that. And, and a few of them were kind enough to say, well, pastor, what do, you, what do you think it is? And I gave them my truthful answer. And you know what it is? I have no clue. Because I'm telling you, there's no formula to it. That I'll, you know it's not the preaching. I mean, good, I've done everything to butcher that I can. I mean, the music's great for sure, but when you trust God to do what only God can do, God will show up and show out, y'all. So I thought with all these people giving their life to Christ, I mean, literally a couple hundred over the last few weeks, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if people understood that when you get baptized here, you typically wear a t-shirt that says redeemed. What does that actually mean? I mean, it's not a word we walk around using. You know, we, sometimes uh, you know, see like a, a ball player that strikes out in a big event and he'll come up to the plate next time and somebody say, well, now is a chance to redeem that. But that's something that he can do. But what about redeemed when somebody does that for you? And it, I got to thinking about your desire to know more about the Bible. And I, I wanted to take you to the Old Testament today into the tiny little book of Ruth. Because in Ruth... We have a two-word definition of what Jesus does when you wear that shirt that says redeemed. And the two-word is kinsman, redeemer. Now, kinsman meaning family. Redeemer literally meaning do for you what you cannot do for yourself and reclaim you for all that is beautiful. So in Ruth chapter 1, here's, here's what it says. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel... A severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem, don't forget that. A man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab. So another, he live, leaves Israel and goes to Moab. All right, now this is, this is a guy who's leaving like the U.S. and is going to the Philippines. Are you with me? 
All right, totally different experience. Taking his wife and two sons with him, the man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Remember that name, Naomi. Their two sons, Malon and Kilion, they were Ephrathites. So literally, they were from Bethlehem, okay, in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died. Bummer. And Naomi's left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women, so they married Filipino women. Not literally, you're with me, right? (laughs) One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. I always confuse, I'm always fearful when I read this text, I'm going to say Oprah. (laughs) But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone with her two sons and her husband gone. Okay, now, here's, how, here's the background of the story before I get into everything. So, Naomi is married. There's a famine in the land. Her husband, Elimelech, takes her and her two sons, and they go to Moab. When they get to Moab, <laughs> watch this. The two sons and Elimelech, they're all dead, even after the two sons get married. So, now you have, you have a single mom widow, and, and you've got two wives that are widows, in a time in which literally women couldn't own property and had no rights. We've come a long way, y'all. All All right? They had nothing. the, The thing we need to understand is they didn't have the right to literally go earn a living. They had nothing. I mean, they literally, unless there was somebody there that was family to care for them, they were on their own. So you've got three women that have had this terrible situation happen in their life, and where do we go from there? So Naomi's like, come on, girls. We're going to go back over to Bethlehem, back to Israel. Now, remember, though, the two girls are Moabites. So in other words, like, they're Filipino, and she's going to bring them to the States. All right? So we got this radical change in everything in their life. And along the way, Naomi says to the two girls, maybe it wasn't fair for me to ask you to come with your mother-in-law back. Why don't you go live with your mother's? So one of them says, okay, I'm out. And she goes to be with mom. But Ruth has something that we hear at weddings all the time. Ruth looks to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she says, entreat me not to leave you or forsake you. For where you go, I will go. And where you live, I will live. And your people are going to be my people. And listen to me, and your God's going to be my God. We say that at weddings, but it had nothing to do with a wedding. It had everything to do with faithfulness right? Which is why we use it in a wedding. So they head back, right? But when they get back to Israel, while there is food there, they don't own anything. They don't own anything. Now, Elimelech, Elimelech, which is Naomi's former husband, he had owned a little property back in Bethlehem, but they couldn't claim it. They couldn't even live on it. It wasn't theirs, right? It's just sitting there. So they move back and Naomi says to Ruth, go find us something to eat. So it's in harvest season, and Ruth starts to do this thing called gleaning, all right? Now, gleaning is literally picking up scraps. So you got laborers out there working in the field. They're cutting the barley down, and the leftover scraps, people would come and glean from that, and they would pick it up, right? And they would pick up the scraps. Now, this was the Israelites' plan for for literally unemployment, all right? This was Israelites' welfare plan. So Ruth is up there picking up the scraps, and she's doing it in Boaz's field. Now, remember the name Boaz, all right? Boaz owns the field, and (laughs) she's picking up the stuff, and that's where we pick up the story, all right? So there they are, and Ruth and Boaz, are. it all starts right there. Now, you may be saying, Chuck, why is a love story in the early part of the Old Testament What does that have to do with me understanding the Bible and me understanding Jesus? Everything. Everything. If you get the concept of a kinsman redeemer, you will get the concept of Jesus in your life. But if you don't get that concept, you're going to always think to yourself, well, what's the big deal about me and Jesus? I mean, is it more than just heaven? Oh, heavens, yes. So much more. So you say, well, what is the whole book really about? It is a book that screams to us, God cares for you. The whole concept of a kinsman redeemer is that God cares for you. So in the second chapter of Ruth, beginning in in verse 2, here's what it says. One day Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, 
Let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who's kind enough to let me do it. And Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Now watch this. It's really important to recognize that Boaz, while he is really, really, really distant, is somehow connected in the family. All right? Now this is this important picture here. So I, I want you to get the fact that, you know, love is strange when it shows up, right? I mean, like, I, I remember Jenny telling me when we first started dating, I don't really want to be in a relationship, and I really don't care anything about getting married. And I thought, well, you're the perfect girl for me, you know? But I remember getting off a plane one day, coming from the West Coast, and I called her, and I said, hey, Jen, I, I, I hate to be the one that breaks this to you, but I think I love you. And she was like, duh. Duh. Well, that's a lot of affirmation right there. You know, I'm looking for I love you too, and I got duh. But here we are, married and happy, and life couldn't be any better. And I think about all that. Love happens in the weirdest ways. But Ruth found herself in a terrible situation. I don't want you to miss this. Ruth found herself in a terrible situation. What happened to Ruth is she'd lost everything. But she didn't just lose everything. I mean, there was no hope for Ruth that tomorrow could be better. I mean, there is no hope in that whatsoever. I mean, but don't, don't, don't make this like a lot of folks try to make the story of Ruth and Boaz into this beautiful, quaint, sweet little story happening out in the shepherd's fields outside of Bethlehem. Don't do that, all right? Ruth was in a terrible situation, or as Charles Barkley would say, a terrible situation. And while, while she's in that terrible situation, she realizes she'll probably never marry again. She's in a foreign land. She owns nothing. She has nothing. All I'm doing is picking up scraps in a field. There is nothing in this space for me. Nothing. But you know, when we think all is lost, hope has a way of showing up. Have you ever noticed that? When you, when you think that everything is gone, hope has a way of showing up. And I look back at, in the story of my life, and I think, I can't tell you how many times I thought, there, I, I'm out of hope. I mean, there's no way tomorrow's could, could be any worse, but there's no way it could be better. You know, there are a lot of people watching online or in this room, and you're thinking, my life is hopeless, and my life is helpless. Hopeless in that I don't see where things can get better, and helpless, there's nobody going to help me do it. That I'm all alone, and there's nothing left to do. And we find ourselves often in a space in which we need hope to show up. I mean, it's not unlike the story over in the Gospel of Matthew where the disciples are out in the middle of the boat and in the middle of the night between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., the storm is raging and they're about to sink and Jesus shows up and what does he do? Say, peace be still. There are seasons in my life where I've literally had to listen to the voice of the Lord say, Chuck, Calm down, sit down, take a breath, peace be still. And in the midst of this, Ruth finds herself where there's no help, there's no hope. But did you, did you know that Ruth's problem is the same problem we have? We've got a terrible situation. I mean, hers was plainly obvious, but you know, I had to understand that mine is plainly obvious. I, You've heard my story before, standing on the front row in that tent in Warwick, Rhode Island, listening to an NFL ball player telling me the story of Jesus and standing and then saying, I'm in a terrible situation. I don't have any hope. My choices of sin has kept me from God. I am separated from heaven. I'm separated from his hope. I'm separated from everything. And I, I had to come face to face with that, my terrible situation. But I'll never forget him saying, but hope showed up. In the form of Jesus, who gave his life that my sin could be paid for, that I could have heaven, but I could have hope and peace today. And so when, when he said, if you want Jesus, I was like, I'm in, man. I'm in. I think one of the reasons I love ball so much is that a ball player led me to Jesus. And so there, there's Ruth. And you know what? She needed a kinsman redeemer. Like her only hope was that somebody in family would decide to protect her, provide for her, and they were willing to do so. That's what she needed. But it didn't seem to be anywhere out there. But Ruth is shown in abundant love. 
Ruth never complains. You're never in the story do you see her whining about having to glean, about having to pick up the scraps, about having to do... You never read that. All you ever read about Ruth is faithfulness. She's just so much better than I was. I was such a whiner. I mean, God, why would you let me go through this garbage? God, why would you let this happen? God, why? Have you ever been there where you're just like a God whiner? And you know what I've learned? Never trust a whiner. Because the feelings are always about me, me, me. And that was me. What Jesus did in my life was he didn't just, he didn't just forgive my sins. He didn't just promise me heaven. He, was, he replaced me with him. Now, don't get me wrong. I haven't done it well all the time, man. My me likes to come out. I mean, I'm guilty of a lot of me. But she found herself in need of abundant love. I mean, Ruth doesn't complain. She keeps making the best of her situation. But what she finds picking up the scraps in Boaz's field is that Boaz sees her. He sees her work. He sees her faithfulness. I mean, first of all, Boaz sees this and he sees her terrible situation. He's polite and he observes what's going on, but he noticed that she's gracious. That she hasn't come into a foreign land and said, this is what I demand. She didn't come in and say, these are my rights. She came in and did what she could. But the people that working around Boaz said, she's a hard worker. She's willing to go out and do her part. Later on in chapter two, it says this. I hope, now this is the, the, the words of Ruth. I hope I continue to please you, sir, talking to Boaz. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. And at mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with his harvesters and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. And she ate all she wanted and still had some left over. And when Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back into town and showed it to her mother-in-law. Ruth also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Where did you gather all this grain today, Naomi asked. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I work with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He is showing you kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of the family redeemers. Now watch this. He is removed so many times. I mean, she, she didn't even know where his property was. I mean, he's so far removed that he's not next in line, y'all. He has no responsibility to Naomi. He has no responsibility to Ruth. In verse 19, it says, where did you gather all that? Where did you work? May the Lord bless them. And going down to verse 22, good, Naomi explained. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you'll be safe with him. So Ruth worked along with women in Boaz's fields. And gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. And then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while, she lived with her mother-in-law. What he sees and what he hears stirs Boaz's heart. Now watch this. Ruth isn't the only one showed in abundant love. Later, Naomi hears of how Boaz has treated Ruth. She says, who showed you so much favor? Now the word favor... Now, y'all know that when when I try to teach the scriptures, one of the things that's important is if you can understand the context which was written, you can truly begin to understand the context today in which you receive it. And one of the ways we understand it is when the word favor is used here, it is the Hebrew word, which is what the Israelite Bible would have been written in Hebrew. It is the Hebrew word for chesed. And the word chesed literally means loving grace. Now watch this. These two words are really powerful in how we receive an abundant love well. Because when you look at these, say, one, loving, I have found myself where I was in desperate need to be loved. You know what we've learned? That in in our brain, when we feel loved, we are simultaneously feeling valued. And when we feel valued, we feel loved. We don't really feel loved until we're valued. We don't really feel valued until we're loved. 
When you look at your marriage, you think, how well do you value one another? How well is it then that you love one another? Because then you find this mutual value where all of a sudden it's easy then to have mutual accountability. And it's easy to find mutual sharing of grace, loving grace. Grace meaning something you can't earn, something you can't buy, something you can't deserve, but something you can get. So what does Boaz do? He expresses love and he extends grace. Now watch this. When Jesus came into our lives, he is what he did. He filled us with his love and he extended and filled us with his grace. But not that we become just a recipient of it, but we become an extension of it. That we begin to look at all people, black, white, brown, purple, orange, and extend love. That we look at all people and extend grace. And when we do that, we have the capacity then to be able to extend this abundant love. It's one thing to love people when we see how you can get something in return, isn't it? Like it's easy to try and be gracious and kind to somebody when you think, if I do that, I get something in return. If I extend kindness to them, maybe I get something back. But Boaz, would he, there was nothing that she could offer him. She had no money. She had no status. She had no fame. She had no relationships. There was nothing that was going to benefit Boaz. Now watch this. I offered nothing to Jesus. Nothing. And, and to this day, the only thing I offer the world that is worth anything is Jesus himself. And if you're here today and you say, Chuck, but I want to matter in this world, allow yourself to matter in being able to receive an abundant love and then be able to pass that through loving grace to the rest of the world. Because this is what Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And listen to what Jesus said, I come to give you a new command that you do what? Love one another. Well, there it was. Boaz is there plain as day, extending this grace-filled love. What is it that we know from Jesus saying that no greater love has a man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends? Ruth was in a terrible situation. Ruth received an, an amazing love. We're in a terrible situation, separated from God because of our sin, in need of an abundant love that Jesus extends to us, by leaving the grandeur and beauty of heaven, coming to this earth, living a sinless, perfect life, giving his life, not because the Romans killed him, not because the Jews killed him, but because our sin killed him, allowing himself to be buried, dead as a hammer, raised from that grave three days later, hang around for about 40 days and let hundreds of people witness it, and then leave and go sit back in heaven beside God the Father doing this one thing, praying for you right now. Now that's an abundant love. I mean, it, had I showed up to play the part of Jesus and those people started accusing me of what I had never done, what would I have done? I'd have fought back. What, what would I have done? I, I would have looked out for number one. What would I have done? Well, what's in it for me? See, the only thing that Jesus got was our love in return. That's it. What, I don't offer the Lord Jesus anything but he gave me everything. That's an abundant love. Now, in the middle of all this, what we know is that Ruth finds an amazing hope. Ruth's overwhelmed with Boaz's mercy and kindness. So as the story goes on, Naomi, the mother-in-law says, Ruth, we need a kinsman redeemer. Now, there's a fella in the family in Bethlehem that is way closer in line to the family than Boaz is. So it's his job to become the kinsman redeemer. So Boaz goes to this dude and he says, hey, Naomi's husband, who is now dead, owned this property. You can take the property, buy it, and it's all yours. And this guy's like, yeah, I'm in. That's a great little piece of dirt. I could expand my cattle. I could expand my herd. I, I could grow. I, that would be awesome. And then Boaz says, but as a kinsman redeemer, you don't just get that. You you get Ruth. And he's like, mm, uh, no. That's, the price for that one's a little too much, and he walks away from the deal. So Boaz, who doesn't give a flip about the property, but has now fallen in love with Ruth, is like, next man up. Are you see where this is going? So Naomi says to Ruth, 
girl, listen to your mother-in-law. Boaz is going to lay down and chill. I want you to go over there. And she literally says, doll yourself up a little bit. Put a little perfume. Come on. And then take the little blanket and uncover his feet and just lay down there. Don't hug him. Don't kiss him. Don't reach over to his hand and do, you know, the love signal like, oh, yeah, baby. You know, none of that. Just put your head down his feet. He wakes up and he sees this sign, which is ancient, for I need a kinsman redeemer. Now watch this. When we have the willingness to put our head and our pride and our self at the feet of Jesus, what he does is wrap his arms around us, embrace us, and extends an abundant hope. So Boaz is like, okay, I can do this. So he has to bring all the elders around the gate to make it official. And literally what happens is the guy who's supposed to do it has to swap a sandal with him. It was a picture of, okay, I'm not walking on that property. This is yours. And he takes her on. What we needed, y'all, is this abundant hope. You see, the three things that were required to be a kinsman redeemer was you had to be willing to bring them in your family. I mean, the second thing was you had to be willing to provide and protect for them. But now here's the biggest one. You had to have a desire to do it. Like, not just desire to get the good, but take all the bad. You see, Jesus' desire with me and you is that I know all the bad, he says, and I'll take all of that because I want to give you all the good. The beauty of Jesus is that it's not what you can do for him, but what he has already done for you, and you receive it. Notice how Jesus fulfills the same requirements as a kinsman redeemer. He's a close relative, for the scripture says to refer to him as father, family, joint heir, and friend. He can and he does provide for us because he is all-powerful. He was there at the beginning and will be there where there is no end. The Alpha and the Omega. All things were created in him, through him, by him, and for him. In the beginning was the Word, which is Jesus. He was with God and he is God. He can and does provide for us because he is all-powerful, creator and sustainer of the universe. And finally, Jesus has a great desire to be our redeemer, the creator of the universe, the one who became a man so he could die for us, wants to redeem you. Now, you may have come here this morning needing a little spiritual pick-me-up or like, Chuck, can you pat me on the head, make me feel good. Chuck, I didn't, I didn't want a theological lesson today. But it's possible that you came here today and the owner of this house you didn't realize was going to show up. You thought it was just the preacher. But what if the owner of this house is walking up and down your aisle right now saying, I'll be your kinsman redeemer. I'll choose to extend to you this abundant love. Maybe you're just trying to survive. Maybe you're walking around picking up the scraps that the world offers you today like Ruth. And Boaz in the form of Jesus, sees you, recognizes you, knows your name, and hears you, and wants to provide for you, and wants to extend to you his abundant love. Years ago, off the coast of New England, a, a submarine was rammed by a boat, and that submarine sank off the Massachusetts coast. And as it did, naturally, we sent rescue divers to find any survivors. And they got down to that, to that submarine, and they could hear somebody tapping out in Morse code, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Nonstop. Some of y'all right now are tapping on the whole of your life. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? There's single mamas in the room thinking, is there ever going to be any hope? There's folks walking through a divorce or been through a divorce saying, is there any hope? There's folks who stretch financially trying to care for your aging parents. You're thinking, is there any hope? Is there any hope? There's folks here alone and tired and exhausted and financially just struggling. You say, is there any hope? Is there any hope? And he, listen to me, folks. The story of Ruth and Boaz, yes, is a true story about love. But the reason that little four-chapter book in the Old Testament is so important is that in the story, me and you are Ruth picking up the scraps that the world offers. 
And in the story, the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, is Jesus, who sees you and knows you and wants to extend an abundant love with amazing hope and wants to share with you, I am your kinsman redeemer. Friend, today, it's time to be redeemed. Let's pray. God, I know there are folks in the room and online today. There'll be folks at the next service and online later who are trying to figure out where is their hope. And like old bird did, Lord, we know we find it in Jesus and Jesus alone. God, for people in this room that are trying to figure out where do I go and what do I do now, Lord, then give them the courage to say, Jesus, I need you, and I'm calling on your name. Now, I want you to do me a favor. Just raise your head up, open your eyes, look right here. Y'all know, man, I, I really despise sissy Christianity. It drives me bat crazy. I, mean, I, I just don't like it when preachers say every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking. We know you are. Jesus didn't die all alone in a closet, and he certainly didn't die in a field far away with daisies and lilacs around him. He died at the corner of Maine and Wall Street where the whole world saw him. And if today you need that kinsman redeemer, he says, just call on my name. Well, Chuck, I don't, I don't even know that. What's the preacher talk for call on Jesus' name? Well, according to the Bible, it's this simple. Jesus, will you forgive me? Because you're the only one that can pay the price. Jesus, I believe you died for me and you rose from the dead for me. And Jesus, I want you to come be my redeemer. You say, well, Chuck, do I, do I have to join your church? Nope. Do I have to get baptized? Nope. Do I have to go on a mission trip or give something? No. But right now, you might need a kinsman redeemer because we all do. And today, if your prayer is this, say it with me right where you're at, Jesus. No, I'm not kidding. Say it with me, Jesus. Will you forgive me? I believe you died for me and you rose from the dead for me. Come be my redeemer. And friend, if that's your prayer today, his loving grace, his abundant hope is yours. Not just for heaven, but for Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday and Monday and Wednesday and Friday. And he wants to give you a life filled with abundant grace. And if that's your prayer today, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand wherever you are. Let me see who you are. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Who else? Amen. 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 Hear me, church. Your kinsman, Redeemer, loves you so abundantly that he wants to go before you and make a way. So before we go, let's worship him. Come on, church.
Redeemer, Jesus the Lord, go before you and make a way and make your crooked path straight. What was that? No, no, what was that? Let your kinsman Redeemer, the Lord Jesus, not just go before you, but go within you and bring you peace and joy, fulfillment and contentment. Because friend, he is always good and you are always loved. And when life gets weird and things are just out of sorts, let your kinsman redeemer come along behind you and pick you up and carry you. Not around the mess, but right through the stinking middle of it. Only to set you down victoriously on your two feet and wipe away your tears, kiss you on the forehead, wrap you up in his big loving arms so you can hear him say, my child, say it with me church, I love you. God bless you. Go in peace.